National Educational Television presents African Writers of Today, a series of programs surveying the literary scene in contemporary Africa. In this program, recorded in the library building of the University of Ghana, we will meet with Professor William Abraham, Associate Professor of Philosophy, author of a recent book, The Mind of Africa. Professor Abraham will be interviewed by the host of this series of programs, Louis Nkosi, South African author, journalist, and broadcaster, and Mr. Wole Shoyinka, Nigerian poet, playwright, and lecturer in English at the University of Ife in Nigeria. Mr. Nkosi. The reason why we are here in the University of Ghana is to meet and talk with Dr. Abrahams on the general problems of African uh, culture and literature. Dr. Abrahams trained as a philosopher at the University of Ghana before proceeding to Oxford, where he later gained recognition as the first black African to become fellow of All Souls. Dr. Abrahams last year published a book which has become one of the most controversial book on Africa, The Mind of Africa. Dr. Abrahams, in your book, which I've just mentioned, in dealing with African literature, you seem to have had definite ideas as to what the artistic obligations of African authors uh, should be. I wonder if you could um, develop that thought a bit and tell us exactly what uh, artistic obligations you had in, in mind? Yes, I wasn't thinking merely of artistic obligations. What I had in mind was this, that if some writers wish to be called African writers, and by this do not merely wish to refer to the color of their skin, then there must be something connected with literature that they have in mind. A person like Chinua Achebe, for example, has been known to say that he is writing, catering specifically for an African educated audience. Now when he says this, the presumption is that he believes that there is something in the way of literature that an African educated audience needs, which other producers of literature cannot provide. Now it occurs to one that there might be a number of things that might distinguish what, my, what one might call as African literature from other kinds of literature. First, I wish to say that by African literature, I do not necessarily understand literature written in some African language, nor indeed literature written necessarily by an African. Though what I have in mind is such that only Africans can perhaps do it with justice and success. I think that African literature must be based within the living heritage of the African peoples. Now this can be done in a number of ways. First, in idiom and style. As African writers in English and French, for example, can make certain distinctive literary features of their own languages, culture and thought, stand behind their expression in English and French. To some extent, it is said that Sango achieves this. It is said that in his poetry, he creates a certain kind of music that is highly reminiscent of the music of drums, anyway, reminiscent of Africa. But um, the first thing that I have in mind when I talk of African literature is that African writers in English and French can make to stand behind their language certain literary aspects of their own African languages. Second, they can also write for and from their African society. I myself see literary persons as persons who produce a certain type of critique of society. When you talk about uh, living heritage, and I must say that um, I, uh, I'm glad to use this expression, a living heritage, um, if this implies um, 
you admit that what is now, what exists at present, is uh, the legacy, is the framework within which uh, the writer has to work. In other words, um, there can, I believe, be um, a hankering backwards. In other words, uh, a recreation of a past existence for its own sake, rather than an examination of the past uh, in view of present uh, social needs. Um, could you just clarify, I mean, could you say whether I am with you in this particular aspect, uh -huh. that you see a writer's um, uh, situation, social situation, as one which exists now, rather than a recreation? Because I think there uh, is a kind of contradiction in the fact that you sort of mentioned Songo almost in the same breath. Uh, for me, this represents a kind of contradiction. Contradiction between what and what? You know, to take your um, question rather than your remark, mm, okay. um, I shall say that um, I qualified heritage by living mm -hmm. deliberately. I know that there are African writers um, who think of what they imagine must have been the past of Africa, and because they are not competent to dish this out as historians, or anthropologists mm. think that they will get away by putting these things in the form of novels or plays or poems. Now, I didn't have in mind the things that they fancied represented the past of Africa. That was my intention in describing our heritage as a living heritage. Present African writers must write as being present African writers. That is, they must realize that they live in Africa today and now that they should produce critiques of African society, they must take African societies as things which exist now. Now African societies as they exist now include a number of facets. First, the old traditional Africa, which is still living by the way, because I myself believe that up to 80% of Africa today is still traditional. Then of course, there are influences in Africa, mainly Muslim influences and Euro-Christian influences. Now these are here as part and parcel of modern Africa intermixed. And a writer that wishes to analyze African society in his work so that he brings out significant social factors and can, on the strength of his analysis, base prophecy, and that is, be able to write in such a way that one can recognize his work as mirroring African society, not as some dead historical thing, but as a living presence out of which something is growing. Now, in order that an African writer should be able to do this, he must take cognizance of all these three facets. In uh, trying to mirror traditional African societies, doesn't this in some way limit, um, um, say, an African poet by sort of confining him to certain themes which would be much more appropriate to, to traditional societies? The imagery that uh, occurs in, in lots of poetry by Sengo, for instance, would emphasize certain aspects that are, are traditional. In other words, um, if, he, if an African poet was to take his themes in, say, present-day Lagos life, um, might, might he not move away from, from this kind of tradition? I will, uh, if I may, just try to pinpoint that a bit further by uh, reminding you that in your book, the example of poetry which you chose to um, quote um, were, in fact, uh, translations of poetry in Akan Yes. in one of the Akan languages, yes. I believe, and was in every sense um, what you might call a traditional uh, yes. piece of work. Yes. I just, um, well, I have an embarrassment of questions here. <laughs> I don't know what to do. But um, if I take them in the order in which they came, um, you wish to know what um, a literary person writing a poem on Lagos might wish to take into account. Of course, it depends on the kind of poem that he wishes to write. But if what you have in mind is this, whether it is possible to write an authentic poem about Lagos and introduce traditional, say, Yoruba concepts and ways of life, yes. And I dare say that there are lots and lots, thousands of persons living in Lagos 
poor traditional Yoruba, especially in Africa, merely living in a capital city and doesn't change one, doesn't uproot one. Mm, but the experiences of the modern, uh, you see, um, you have in your book, one thing I think uh, stands out very uh, clearly, you have a very, a very clear idea of what you want African society to be, and you have a very clear idea of what the various uh, builders of society, the artists, uh, the writers, the um, economists, what places and what functions they should serve within that society. And um, the point which Liz raised, I think, is this, that uh, there is, uh, it is possible that one can develop uh, a kind of artificial culture in this respect. Because... I think that Sango does that. Uh -huh. This, this yes. was the contradiction I, I mentioned earlier. No, no, not the contradiction in me. The contradiction is in Sango. Mm. Um, you remember that when I mentioned him, I said that I would have a few words to say yeah, about him. Yes, that's true. Mm. Sango does not, in my opinion, write as an African poet. Mm -hmm. But what he does is to write French poetry, which is interlarded with odd African allusions. Any Frenchman can do that. Um, I think that it is significant that always he talks of forgiveness and bridges. That he sees himself not as an African writer, writing in Africa and for Africa, motivated, pushed, inspired by the complex present African situation, which in his country, I dare say, would include French influences. He does not write like that. He's not content with the French influences in his own country, but rather, he writes, in my opinion, as an apologist of France speaking to Africa, who understands an African language and an African idiom and can use African mannerisms in his rhythm and cadences. That is what I think Senghor does. There's nothing particularly African about his poetry. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm also interested in this, in this question, but indirectly. Um, I remember in the Cameroons that we we played um, back from uh, the tape recorder a poem by Senghor to, to some Africans who uh, perfectly understand French. Um, they worked as, as waiters. And immediately we started playing this poem back to them. They all uh, left, they walked away, they simply weren't interested. Now what I, I have in mind is um, what, what role has an African uh, author to play, if any, in the, in the national building, national building in the young countries of Africa or elsewhere. Do you have any, yes. any ideas what, what his social obligations might be? Yes, I have a few opinions. Um, I have said that the poet, the novelist, and the dramatist are all, in my opinion, people who produce critics of society. If they live in African society, then I expect them to produce critics of African society. But these literary men and women cannot have their axes lying outside Africa and claim to be African writers, nor can they even have their axes completely buried and immersed in a romantic African past that has no historical basis or, more important, has no contemporary significance. As critics of society, they can legitimately be concerned with the past to the extent that this past conditions the present and affects the future. This kind of point of view can legitimize um, preoccupation with the past. Mm -hmm. But the preoccupation should never be allowed to degenerate into sheer archaeology. Uh, could I just okay. uh, develop this question a little now bit I think, better? Uh, I'm sorry. Now, I think that these writers in Africa must, as it were, contain the revolutionary changes in Africa in their tummy. That their poetry, their plays, their novels should be results of their experience, you know, their digestion of contemporary African situations, together with the revolutionary elements, you know, the pace, the tremendous pace of change, and the ideas for the future, ideas of regeneration and salvation, 
all these are things that writers can profitably put in their work. Professor Abrahams, uh, why do you think it significant or important for African writers writing in English or French to address themselves to a particular audience that is African? Why couldn't they address themselves to Frenchmen or to, to Americans or to, or to the English of course it audience? Is, it is legitimate for them to do that. I don't think that um, the French public or the English public feels a particular lack um, which can be filled by African writers in English or French. They themselves recognize that literature has a function to play in society. That English writers of English literature, French li writers of French literature, are not going to fulfill these functions and needs for African society. What reason would they have for doing that? Now, it is natural, if anyone should do this, that African literary creators should undertake this. Just as African scientists undertake to solve some of the scientific problems of Africa, African historians undertake to go into the history of Africa, African politicians concern, concern themselves with the politics of Africa. Why should African um, literary creators be exempted from um, services that they themselves recognize as genuine? Now, um, we all, uh, at least we find evidence uh, all the time uh, that one of the greatest preoccupations of uh, those who consciously think of a new African society is the preservation of, um, of um, the the philosophies, the ethics of traditional society. Now, again, there seems to be an onus always placed on the writer, um, the creative writer, as a feeling always that it is his duty to preserve uh, these elements. But the pace at which um, African nations are going um, right now, the new, uh, the, the, the pace is such that lots of writers feel themselves out of sympathy with these, uh, with these uh, sort of essential, to use uh, an expression, this, this essential culture of Africans. They, they have a feeling, and I think with some justification, that there really is no, um, no place for this in the contemporary uh, thinking, the, con the contemporary experience of the African. Now, it seems to me there is a danger in, um, in sort of legislating. It seems to me that there is a kind of constriction of the uh, of the artist within society, but there's a, this sort of political expectation in his work. It is true that the philosophies must, in some way, be preserved. But is it really the best way to make the artist conscious of sort of, to use your own word again, this interlarding of traditional philosophies in a work which you know which really has no uh, place for that? No, I don't think that um, writers should interlard their mm. work with anything. Mm. Um, I myself don't think that they should restrict themselves um, to what is past. I think that they should be creative, that they should feel urgency in their work, and they should be contemporary. No, I'm sorry, please, but if I may interrupt, I do not suggest uh, confinement now. No, no, I'm yes. talking even just about uh, the, the attempt to make the artist I was conscious of yes. the embodiment. Yes, I, I, I'll, I'll come to that in a more direct way. Mm. If the concern is to preserve philosophies in Africa as philosophies, then and there are others who might perhaps more successfully do this than artists. I myself do not think that an artist, queer artist, is called upon to preserve a philosophy as a philosophy or a history as a history. But if an artist is going to reflect the soul, the human condition of a people, then he has to live through the experience of the people. And this experience of the people is not antiquated, archaeological, buried in the past. I said I thought that 80% of Africa was still traditional. It is here today. And if the uh, artist is going to have a complete picture, a complete critique of the African society, then even if he does not produce a bird's eye view of the society, he must at least be aware of the underlying forces, you know, the social and human forces in the society of which he undertakes to become critic. May I ask, from which segment of this percentage would you say that the present uh, uh, expressive uh, creative 
artist at the moment, and then the novelist or the poet, from which segment would you say, um, which is it the 80% or the 20% that produces the, uh, the, the well, current? It, it depends on what the audience is and the method of publication. Because if you mean published you know, poems, plays, and novels put down on paper and in ink, yeah. then naturally, and this can only be done by people who can read and write. But if Africa has had a literary tradition, then surely uh, literature in Africa cannot have started with letters. No? Africa has, in fact, had a traditional literary tradition. Mm. If you, um, uh, you will see that I'm not a poet <laughs> or a dramatist, and, and if you ignore um, uh, these horrible expressions. Mm. Mm. And um, there are people among these 80% who continue to produce that kind of thing. And of those who can write, there are some who deliberately wish to reaffirm their connection with that kind of pristine and elemental um, literary productivity. Now you say that in my book I translated a poem written in Akan by Professor Nketiah. Now this was my reason for doing that. Uh, to underline the fact that literature in Africa today is not only what one can read in English or French or in vernacular newspapers, but that there is a literary method and li a literary production still going on among the 80%. And there are people who have taken the trouble to look into this. And I quoted in translation in Ketia's poem as an example of the style and feeling of that kind of um, literary production. Yes. Professor Abrahams, in, in this book you also dealt with purely cultural matters. And um, I think that you use the Akan society uh, as, uh, as, as a paradigm of the African society. I wonder, say, if you, if you could say whether you see any uh, underlying you know, unifying factor for all African cultures well, south I of the Sahara. Yes, I did indicate that in the book. Mm. Of course, I pointed out that when one, well, that it is deliberately that one talks of a paradigm. When you call something a paradigm, you mean that other comparable things differ from this paradigm in important respects. There are differences in Africa, of course. Everyone knows the differences. That is why it is high time to emphasize the similarities, too. One, um, one point where there is a contradiction in the present creation of society is that um, I have a feeling that the present, uh, those who actually shape, those who have an influence in the shaping of society today, uh, constitute uh, very much these uh, modern literate theorists, mm, who although they are able to say in a kind of um, idealistic way, to point out the necessity, or rather uh, to, build up, uh, to build up uh, a past and important history, I do not feel that at the moment, the more expressive, the more expressive people in society come uh, from this 80%. In other words, How do you know? Although, What's your evidence? No, wait a minute. Mm -hmm. Although, for instance, there is plenty of uh, writing, there is plenty, like, as for instance in Songo, uh, there is enough to indicate an awareness of this rich uh, traditional past. But Songo mm. doesn't belong to the 80%. Mm. Oh, no, 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 that's what I'm saying. Among the 20%. Yes, there is I enough see, evidence. Sorry, you said you, you see what no, I'm yes, saying? Yes, Although there is enough of that, but I, um, I do not see uh, the process. And I would like you to give me um, examples, for instance, here in Ghana, where you think that this you know, statement, uh, which statement has been, sorry. which um, examples in Ghana, which sort of falsify the statement of mine. Which I'd statement? like to know what has been uh, done in uh, Ghana today yes. or in any other parts of Africa mm -hmm. to ensure that this very vital uh, part of the uh, traditional yes, society, see, yes. which, as you say, is yes. believed by the majority yes, of the Africans whole, the whole, anyway. the, Practically the whole of mm. Ghanaian literary production mm. is like that. Mm. If you take the poetry of Michael Dayanan and a play which he wrote, mm. the play especially was about Komfu Anoche, mm. you know, um, a, one of the magical founders of Ashanti. If you take the efforts of Ifwa Sutherland, they are judged in the same way. And they take their roots firmly and deeply from the society. They recognize the society, the present society, just as in normal African thought, as a society to which the past belongs and the present and the future. 
You know very well that in African thinking, society means the society of the dead, the living, and the unborn. Now, the parallel of this in literature here is that people who produce literature go into their roots. That is to say, they allow themselves to be transported into the past, but not just the past that is dead and gone, but the past that affects the present, just as in traditional Africa, and people who say that the dead, the living, and the unborn belong to the same society also say that the dead continue to influence the present society. So do the unborn, in a way. And so producers of literature become kinds of prophets. Because they, I know they only have two feet, but all the same, they have one in the past, one in the present, and another firmly in the future. You do not agree, then, uh, with the uh, rather common contention that Ghana is rather behind some of the other West African countries in, the out in their output of uh, contemporary literature. What is contemporary literature? It's if you take volume, yes, certainly. Mm. As in the volume of literature, even considering things proportionally, I believe that Ghana lags behind Nigeria. But you will find a certain type of literature in Nigeria. If you take Chinua Achebe, for example, who is a highly respected um, Nigerian novelist, mm you will find that he has been preoccupied with traditional Nigeria in a certain way, as necessarily problematic, as something that has so often to be overcome, sometimes even to be rejected. Mm. Now, Chinua Achebe is in fact a very good novelist. And he is one of those novelists who, in my opinion, come nearest to being African novelists. But leaving Chinua Achebe aside, if you take others, especially French African writers, you find that they all, in fact, reject traditional Africa. When they don't say so, they make apologies for it. They try to explain. And they talk in what must be regarded as sheer nonsense. For example, when Sango says that the African is not intellectual, that reason is Greek and feeling is Africa, that the Africa knows things with his nose, I mean, that's sheer nonsense. What does he think I have above my, uh, above my nose? <laughs> Two pair, a pair of eyes. The reason is not Greek or African or European or American or Russian or what you, what you will. The reason is universal. Africans think just as Greeks did and as the Frenchmen do today. I, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, gentlemen. I, at this stage, I have to cut in. We have run short of time. Thank you very much, Dr. Abrahams. We have been talking here uh, with Dr. Abrahams, Associate Professor of Philosophy at Ghana University and author of The Mind of Africa. This program in the series African Writers of Today was recorded at the University of Ghana near Accra. Featured was an interview with the Ghanaian philosopher William Abraham, author of a recent book, The Mind of Africa. Mr. Abraham was interviewed by the Nigerian poet and dramatist Wole Shoyinka and by the program series host Louis Nkosi, South African author, journalist, and broadcaster. African Writers of Today is produced by National Educational Television in collaboration with the Transcription Center, London. educational television.